Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Coffee Break Hacks, where in the same time I will take you to take a cup of coffee, you'll be learning a new hacking tip, trick, or technique. My name is Tarek, and today we're going to be talking about a CSRF challenge from Portswigger Web Security Academy. CSRF stands for Cross-Site Request Forgery, and today is the first video of a series of multiple CRSF challenges that we'll be discussing and solving together. If you haven't checked out the Portswigger Web Security Academy, I highly recommend that you do. It's a free web security academy available for anybody to access, read about some of the most common web vulnerabilities, and play around with labs to practice your hacking skills. Before we get started, there are a couple prerequisites that you need to keep in mind. First is that you need to have a web proxy tool installed and that you need to be familiar with it, how to use it. For these videos, I'll be using Burp Suite from Portswigger. It doesn't matter if you have installed the community or the pro version. So in these videos, I will not be talking about how to install this tool and set it up, what are its uses and how to use it. I am going to assume that you already know this. The second prerequisite is that you have an understanding of how HTTP and the web in general works. So I am not going to get into the details of HTTP, HTTPS, the requests and responses and so on. I have to assume that you know these basics, otherwise the video will stretch to go on for hours and hours. If you do not have these prerequisites, there are plenty of courses on Hackers Academy that goes through them, or you can find a lot of resources online. So please make sure that you have prerequisites. If you do, let's get started. If you have read the CSRF article in the Web Security Labs, you will know that there are three things that are necessary to be present for any CSRF attack to work. The first one is a relevant action, and that is an action that you, as a quote-unquote an attacker, would want to induce from the end users or from the victim's side. For example, something like changing the email on the user's account. The second thing is that the session handling needs to be cookie-based. So the user session should rely on a cookie. And the third one is that we shouldn't have any unpredictable parameters in the requests, such as, for example, CSRF tokens. So let's say in this video, for example, we're going to be targeting the email change functionality. We'll try to change the user's email to our email as the quote-unquote attacker or bad guy. For this to happen, the relevant action is to change the email. We need to make sure that the session is cookie-based. And thirdly, we need to know exactly how the change is going to happen with all its parameters being predictable. So if, for example, to change a user's email, the user needs to resubmit their password, the attack will fail because we do not know the password of the victim. Now, luckily for us, the first lab begins with a very basic CSRF vulnerability with absolutely no defenses. So here's what our attack steps are going to be. This is our attack strategy. First, we're going to be looking into the update email functionality. We're going to verify that the session is cookie-based. We're going to verify that there are no CSRF tokens and there are no unpredictable parameters. And third, we're going to create the proof of concept exploit code and we're going to host it on our exploit server. So let's do this together. I'm going to go to the CSRF lab and as you can see, it's called the CSRF vulnerability with no defenses. So we know already there will be no defenses, but let's verify it together. So I'm going to click on the link and get the lab started. Once we start the lab, there are some instructions to follow. So we are given a username and a password to be able to log in. So this is going to be our victim username and password. I type in the username, I type in the password, and I'm logged in. Now let's test the change email functionality. So I'll go to change email. And on the right hand side, you can see that my Burp Suite Community Edition, it's the free edition, is running. So let me just clear the history to make things a little bit clearer. And I'm going to type in an email and hit the update email button. We can see the post request here, the first request in my Burp Suite HTTP history. So let me explain a few things that later on I'm not going to go into the details of. But because this is the first video, I'm going to go into a little bit more detail. So when I click on the item here, I'm going to see a couple of things. A request, which you can see on the screen. And there's a response tab, which if I click on, I will see the response that I get from the server upon submitting the request. Now here I can see the HTTP code to be 302. So this I would assume is the correct response from the server when I submit a successful change of email. So when I'm playing around with this request, as you're going to be seeing later on, 
I should be expecting if my attack is successful or if my change of email is successful to see an HTTP response of 302. And as you can see with the request, I have a cookie. So I would assume that the session is cookie based. So this is our first check. And then I can see the email parameter that is getting changed. So it's a pretty straightforward, simple request and response. The reason I was mentioning the response code is because in Burp Suite, we can play around with these requests by sending them to something called the repeater. So if you right click on the request and click on send to repeater, you can go to the repeater tab and here you can change any of these parameters in your request and you can see the response from the server. So let's say, for example, I'm changing the email from Carlos the second to badguy at email.com and I submit the go button. The response, as you can see, is an HTTP 302. That's the identical response that we got when we first did the change email, the successful change email, meaning I can change the email to whatever I want using that basic request and the server will accept it. Now to be 100% technically accurate, a 302 code, a response of a 302 means it's a redirection, meaning that whatever request we've submitted, we're getting a redirection in the response. The response from the server is redirecting us to another source. In that instance, obviously we're being redirected back to the main page because the email submission is successful. So what you want to do normally is you want to follow the redirection by clicking on the follow redirection button. I'm trying to save some time here. I'm not going to click on this because we've already seen how this is going to pan out. But practically speaking, when you're doing your test, you want to follow the redirection because you never know. Maybe you're being redirected to re-authenticate, for example. All right, so let's move on. So as you can see here, we've ticked the three checkboxes all together. The first checkbox is that we needed a relevant action. And the relevant action here is that we want to change an email using the change email post request. The second checkbox is that the session needs to be cookie based. And obviously we can see the cookie here. And the third one is that there needs to be no unpredictable parameters. And as you can see in my request, there aren't any unpredictable parameters. So the first thing that we're checking is that the post request is pretty predictable. As you can see, the URL of the change is slash email slash change. And that's going to be the URL across all users, we would assume. And also you notice that the user is not requested to re-verify or resubmit anything. So for example, the user is not requested to resubmit their password to verify the change of email, which is something you commonly see in web applications. There are also no CSRF tokens in this request. We see none of this stuff. You will learn more about CSRF tokens and how you bypass the poorly implemented ones in future videos. But for now, everything we see on the screen looks predictable. We know what the post request looks like. We can change the email parameter. We don't have to resubmit a password. We don't have to bypass a token. It's all pretty straightforward. So let's verify this from the web application side. I go back to the web application, back to the change email section. Now here's one quick thing I want to show you. And again, I'm emphasizing a few more details in this video because it's the first video. I'm not going to be talking about these things later on. Before I submit the email, I'm going to go to the interception tab and I'm going to click on the intercept is on. This is how we intercept the requests with Burp Suite. So we can manipulate and change the parameters before they are submitted to the server side. So I'm going to type the bad guy's email and I'm going to hit the update email button. You will see that the request has been intercepted. So the proxy and intercept tabs have turned into orange, meaning they need an action. Something is happening. We see the request has been halted. It has not been submitted yet. And for me to submit it, I need to press the forward button. Now, sometimes you will notice random requests going out from your machine while you're operating burp. So for example, here I got a request going out to Google. That's probably because I also have the Chrome browser running, so it's sending some requests in the background. So instead of me just clicking forward for every request, after I change the parameters that I want to change, I turn the intercept to off. And I can go back to my HTTP history. I'll find the email change request. And this is my request where you can see the email is the bad guy's email. And the response is the 302 response as we would have expected. So it's exactly the same request and response we did with repeater. The reason I showed you how to do this with repeater is that because it makes the process much faster. So instead of me going back to the change email functionality and then changing the email, changing the token, changing the cookie, all of these are things that we will be doing in future videos. 
So instead of doing this one by one and intercepting the request and then unintercepting it and so on, I can do all of that from the repeater, which makes my testing process a whole lot faster. Okay, so now we have confirmation that our attack works. We have a relevant action, which is the change email. We have a session that we verified as a cookie based session and we have a request with no unpredictable parameters. So all we need to do now is create the proof of concept exploit code. Where am I gonna get the exploit code? I'll go back to the article about CSRF and conveniently for me, there's an HTML code that I can use. So I'll start the exploit server. I'll go copy this code and then I'll go back to my exploit server. The exploit server in the Web Security Academy Labs simulates a server that is owned by the hacker, by the attacker. This is the server that you want to entice your victim to visit. Once I save this code on my server for the CRSF attack to be successful, I need to find a way to entice the victim to visit the URL of my server. Once they visit it, the code will get activated and the CSRF attack will work. So what does this code do in a nutshell? Basically, this is a post request. It's exactly the same request that the user Carlos has been sending to change the email. Instead of using Carlos's email though, we're going to be using the bad guy email. So when Carlos visits this page, the change email request will get activated and it's as if Carlos has submitted this request himself. But instead of using a different email for Carlos, which is Carlos the second, for example, Carlos will unintentionally and unknowingly will be using the bad guy's email. So the first thing that I want to do is I want to change this URL with the email change URL. And to do that, I'll go back to Burp Suite, right click on the request, copy URL, and then I can paste it in the code. The second thing is I want to obviously change the email address. And this is going to be the bad guy's email address or us as the attackers. So I'm just going to type badguy at email.com. And there you go. It's as simple as that. To verify that all is good, I'll click on store, give it a second, and then I get a response saying that I have successfully solved this lab. So that's it. That's the basic CSRF attack with no defenses. In the next video, we're going to be seeing more variations of this attack with different defenses on how to bypass tokens, for example, or referrer headers and so on. But for now, I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you soon in other videos.